Good morning. It's August the 23rd, and we're doing a Sunday morning series, Our Coming King. We've been walking through the book of 1 Thessalonians, looking at the idea that uh, the early church, that first generation church, and their deep conviction that Jesus was coming again and, and the implications it had on them. And last week we looked at verses 13 through 18 and talked about the end of the age, the coming of Christ, the resurrection, the rapture, some of those important principles. But I want to dig a little deeper and pause just for a moment our study at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and answer what is probably the most common question that is asked when we talk about the end of the age and uh, the claiming of the Lord, the calling out of the church, the snatching away. And that is really the question of what is that resurrection body going to be like? Well, if you'll turn over with me to 1 Corinthians 15, as we look at the uh, parallel passage of Scripture to some of this to get a little bit more answer to that question. We look at our resurrection body, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? You know, that's really a good question, isn't it? How's it going to happen? Uh, what is it that are going on? And some men say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? So the Apostle Paul uses an illustration I think that everybody can understand. And he starts referring to the idea of the principle of a farmer. And notice in verse 36, he says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Now it's important to understand this illustration from nature. And again, I'm a city boy. I was raised on blacktop. The playground at my elementary school was blacktop. And... Uh, I you know, played on concrete my whole life. I'm not a farmer by any definition. But I do understand that when you plant a seed in the ground, that that seed dies. It, it decays. It falls apart. And then it's out of that that new life comes. We see this in nature, in every aspect of life. And, and they understand that when the body is buried, it decays and it falls apart. And, and it's no longer a living body. It's buried because it's dead. But you understand that that little acorn that sets itself in the ground, seeds itself, in 60, 70 years, oh, it's a mighty oak tree, isn't it? It's a good-looking oak tree after about 15, maybe. But boy, those last forever, and they're strong. But they come from little bitty nuts in comparison. That acorn's small, but yet it happens. And you understand the question, how is it that someone can die and then have a resurrected body? Uh, we understand that when we bury a body, it's decayed. In our modern culture, we understand that people lose body parts, military accidents, industrial accidents, war. And um, we also understand that many people have drowned or been in fires and their bodies have been unrecognizable. And how do we handle this question of what will the resurrected body look like? And I think it's important to understand that we have a body that was designed by God Psalm 139 says this, In thy book of all my members were written. In thy book all my members were written, when as yet there was none of them. You see, God designed your body. You're an original. You're a one of a kind. You're somebody special. And when God comes to the place where it's time to resurrect you, he will resurrect you with that book. He's got the schematic. He's got the plans. He knows what you should look like. He knows who you are and what you will look like. He's already written down the message that makes you special. You're a one-of-a-kind creation. You're something God loves and cherishes. And he's going to restore you, especially if you're a born-again believer, with that new body. Now, if you're not a believer, you're going to get a new body also, but unfortunately, it's going to endure a torment for eternity. But the picture of the illustration that the seed has to die is so important because a resurrected body will be new and exciting. You know, I think it's exciting to think just for a minute that that new body won't have the limitations of this body. I, I, I'm not going to have trouble kneeling. I'm going to rejoice in heaven. I'm going to be able to bow before Jesus. What an illustration that the seed must die, as our bodies must die, so we can get a glorious new body. Somebody has said that uh, a piece of coal and a diamond are both carbon. One is in its humility and one is in its glory. And I'm looking forward to that beautiful picture that out of death and out of decay comes life and much more glorious. What an illustration. That little acorn becomes the mighty oak tree. 
And then picking up at verse 38, I think we see a principle of what we would call individuality. But God gives us a body as it has pleased him to every seed, his own body. There is often asked, and perhaps the question I get asked the most is, Pastor, uh, will we know each other in heaven? Will we recognize each other in heaven? Well, it's attributed to Charles Spurgeon, although a lot of things are attributed to Spurgeon that you have trouble finding because he is uh, such a prolific writer. And, uh, but it's attributed to Spurgeon that a conversation had that somebody asked him, will we know each other in heaven? And he responded by saying, will you be a bigger fool in heaven than you are here on earth? Because if you knew somebody on earth, wouldn't you know them in heaven? Or was God going to make you silly or stupid? The word he may have used was fool. I think that's a good enough answer. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says this, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, even as I also am known. You know, I'm excited to know that when I get to heaven, I'm going to recognize my family. I'm going to recognize people who invested in me, and I'm going to recognize people that I got to invest in. I'm going to know people. I'm going to see them there. I'm going to remember them. You know, so I'm so embarrassed anymore. I can't remember everybody's names. I can't remember why I know people. Run into people all the time, try to figure out exactly why I know them. But in heaven, I'll know them and I'll remember why I know them. And what a great blessing it is that those misunderstandings won't exist because of individuality. I'm going to know as I was known and people will know me. Kind of excited about that. You know, people that I've longed to talk to that I haven't seen in forever. People that I haven't met. Got some great grandparents I like to talk to. I'd love to talk to some of those people who, who we lost when I was a little kid. Some of those ladies at church that just prayed for me. And they're long gone. But we'll be individuals in heaven. Jesus is going to make each of us unique. Just as I mentioned with the grain that was planted. He's going to make us special and individual. You know, I am so glad that when we all get to heaven, we're not going to all look alike and act alike. Yeah, once in a while I hear somebody say that we're just like a bunch of drones in heaven. What an idiot. What a, what a horrible thought that God's just going to make one stamp fits all when we get. No, that's silly. We're going to be known as we were known. We're going to be individuals when we get to heaven. And we cannot imagine and we cannot figure out exactly all that's involved with it. But the Bible tells us, indeed, we'll be our own individuals. Look down at verse 42 and I think we'll see there's a major improvement coming. Uh, notice, so also the resurrection of the dead is sown in corruption and is raised in incorruption. Boy, I like that. You know, my body's starting to fail. I'm 54 when I'm being honest. I got a knee that hurts most mornings. I have trouble bowing and kneeling at the altar sometimes, praying with people. But notice the text here. That which is dead is sown in corruption, raised in incorruption, was sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body, is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body, verse 44 of 1 Corinthians 15. Let me remind you that that is the greatest blessing we can imagine. You see, when I was born again, when I was a 13-year-old boy, I'm sorry, when I was an 11-year-old boy on November 13th, 1976, I came to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And when I was born again, the Bible said he made all things new. I got a new spirit, a new heart. I got, I got change of direction, a change of attitudes. But you know what? The, the new body is waiting. I walked out of that church with the same pair of shoes on. Walked out of that church with the same physical limitations I had. But there's a new body waiting. I had the natural body, but there is a spiritual body. It's called a, a progressive thing that happens in my life. I'm more and more like Christ. Uh, sanctification, we've talked about that principle. But here's the principle that you need to understand about your new body, your glorified body. It will be spiritual. It will allow you to enjoy eternity with God. You know, I'm often encouraged by those ugly uh, caterpillars. They metamorphosize and become beautiful butterflies. And that's what my spiritual body is going to be like. I, this natural body, just an old slug of a caterpillar. But guess what? I'm going to get a spiritual body beautiful, and able to endure eternity in the presence of God. And I'm so looking forward to that. Oh, I can't tell you how much uh, that resurrected body is going to be like. I can't tell you how much I'm going to enjoy it. I can't tell you how much you're going to enjoy yours. But all the things that limit us, the pains, the sorrows, the corruption, the sin, the decay, the human experience are gone in that body. It'll be a spiritual body. We can take it to a spiritual place. And it will be able to withstand the joy of being in the presence of Jesus forever. 
what a glorious change that will be. Now notice verse 47 with me, and I think we see the picture of image here. Notice verse 47. For the first man is of earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Ooh, boy. I tell you what, I'm excited that we're right now in the image of the first man. And in that day, we will be in the image of the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such as they, verse 48 continues. They are earthly. And as is heavenly, such are they which are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. But I've got good news for you. The image in heaven, we're going to be more like Jesus physically. We're going to be able to stand in his presence. We're going to be able to understand who he is. Notice the psalmist in Psalm 17 says this, I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. He's going to change these vile bodies into something incredible. We get a new body. I'm so excited about that. What's that body going to be like? Well, I don't know. Oh, come on, Brother Steve, imagine with me. Uh, let's play this game of, let's just use our imagination. No, no, we're not going to do that. First John 3, 2 answers that question better for me than anything else. For it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Brother, it does not yet appear what we shall be. First John 3, 2. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. You see, Jesus had his glorified body here for a season on earth. Following his resurrection, he, he came to earth. He appeared to his disciples. That glorified body, that's, that's, the, that's the snapshot we have of what a glorified body would be like. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. Yeah, we don't know. But we know this that when he shall appear, we shall be like him physically. We'll have a glorified body that will last us through the ages, but we will be like him, and we will see him as he is. You know, talk about an improvement. I can't wait to have the image of the second Adam, the final Adam, the Son of God. And then verse 51 of 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that we're going to be immortal. Behold, I show you a mystery. By the way, this is our nursery theme verse. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. All right, that's our nursery theme. Babies never sleep, but we need to change them all, okay? But notice the verse again, verse 51. I show you this mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on, uh, I'm sorry, we shall be raised, for we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortal, immortality. Folks, I got good news for you. We shall be changed, and we shall be like unto him. The old song says there's no graves on the hillsides of glory. And I want to encourage you that we're going to be immortal, no longer limited by death, no longer limited by the things that are painful and sorrowful in this life, but blessed beyond our imaginations. In that moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised, we shall be changed. For a corruptible must put on incorruption, mortal must put on immortality. And then we're told the old saying is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, which giveth the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me challenge you to understand that this mortal flesh is so damaged by sin. We get a new body. It won't be corrupted by sin. We'll be able to stand with the Savior for ages to come. Now let me encourage you today as we think about this last verse. Verse 58. Therefore, now, always remember, whenever you see the word therefore, ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore, right? Therefore, on the basis of all that 1 Corinthians 15 is teaching, it starts with the gospel, and it leads us to this great discussion of the resurrection of the body and, and being with Jesus. Therefore, beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What an encouragement for us today. 
Can I just say very concisely and very clearly to you this evening that I believe with all of my heart that we have the joy of knowing for sure the encouragement, the inspiration, if you would, to be diligent, to be faithful, to be found worthy, to do the work God's called us to do, for our labor is not in vain. This body may wear out, we get a new one. We praise God for that. Remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're talking about the resurrection, and we're talking about those who are alive and remain that will be caught up with the Lord in the air. What a meeting that will be as you get your new body. You see, God calls us to be faithful. When you became a new creature, a new believer, you got a new heart, new spirit. You got born again. And that will become complete when you stand in his presence in that new body able to endure the blessings of eternity in his presence, able to enjoy the blessings of eternity in his presence. Sin-free, pain-free, sorrow-free in that new body. And it's only achievable through Jesus. Have you come to that place in your life where you've made that decision to follow Jesus? Do you know for sure that you'll get that new body when this one is passed? Are you redeemed? Have you been made new in Christ? Let me encourage you to come to Jesus today. 1 Corinthians 15 is a great reminder. It begins with the gospel and closes with this encouragement to stay faithful. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that we know that Jesus died for our sins, was buried according to the scripture, and rose again on the third day. The gospel that Jesus died for you. He was buried, and he rose again victorious over death, over hell, and over the grave. And it's that victory that gives us our constant hope, our surefire knowledge that Jesus is coming again to claim us and to keep us throughout the ages. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, today I challenge you Look to him by faith. You can go to our website, fbc sellersburg and at the top there's a link to the gospel. And I would encourage you to read that carefully and, and pray that prayer and voice those concerns and repent of your sins towards God and ask Jesus to make you new until that day you stand in his presence in that new body. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you speak to all of our hearts and encourage us today, Lord, as we long to be in your presence the joy of knowing that you're going to make all things new. Father, if there's one today who's not certain of their repentance, if there's one today who's not certain they've come to you by faith, I pray that even right now they would come to you. They might find you in the free pardon of sin and accept your gospel that you died for them, that you were buried according to scriptures, and that you rose again proving you were God. And because you're God, you're able to save Thank you, Lord, for loving us and caring for us in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you.